you've gone to work for a company and you've got a retirement plan or like a 401k or 403b, sometimes they're called 457 plan, a simple plan or something like that, and you're wondering what on earth are these things? What do I need to know? Now, there are all kinds of complex videos that I have out there about investing and really getting into the academics of investing, but I want to get into a really basic video here about how a 401k works and why we have them. Now, many, many moons ago, maybe your parents, your grandparents worked for companies and often they would work there for life. And what the company would do is to help retain the employee so that they would stay with them, they would set up a pension and say, hey, look, we're gonna pay you a paycheck while you work here for the, as long as you work here. And then when you retire, we're going to continue some kind of a check, maybe for 60% of your salary or 70% or something like that. They would have formulas. And the company themselves would set aside money and they would fund the pension plan for you so that you got an income till death do you part. Now those days are long gone. Now pension plans, they're still around to some extent, but they're not as ubiquitous. They're not there in as many places as we used to see them. And the reason is that companies can't afford to do that anymore because now they're competing with companies in countries outside the United States that have lower labor costs or whatever. So what happened is many, many years ago, companies decided to set up programs where the employee could defer some of their own income into the plan to use that money in the future. And those are called 401ks or qualified plans, 403b, so on and so forth. Now, the way it works is this. Typically, if you're in a decent financial position, you'll have an income that is up here, and then you'll have your expenditures or your spending are going to be down here. So income up here, that's your spending right there. As time goes on, what happens is your income goes and drops off because you go into what we call retirement. And you're spending though, you still need to spend money. Even though you're retired, you still need to spend money. So what happens is you don't have any income. How do you fill this gap right here is the question. Well, part of how you fill that gap is social security. So you have social security and the idea behind social security is it pays you a paycheck into retirement, but it's typically not going to replace your entire paycheck while you were working. The way Social Security works is this, is your first income that you earn, let's say that you have a very, very bad job for your entire life and your income in today's dollars never exceeded about $10,000. Well, then what would happen in that case is you would get about 90% of your income in retirement or $9,000 for the rest of your life. You know, it's fine if you're in poverty, but what happens is that percentage drops the higher up your income goes. Your next income after that is replaced only at 32%. Then it gets replaced, if you're a high income person, it's, that's a five, that's 15%. So if, as you can see, the higher income that you are, the better your income, the less of your income Social Security replaces. So you might have as a rule of thumb, I, I hate rules of thumb, but it gives you an idea anyway, that maybe only about 40% of your income gets replaced by Social Security in retirement. Well, unless you wanna go living on 40% of your income, it's probably not gonna cut it. You need to have other savings. That's where the 401k comes from, or that's where it comes in. Social Security replaces some of the income. The rest of the income gets replaced by savings or money that you put aside yourself. Now, if you look at studies of wealthy people, you'll find that a lot of times they might save 10 to 20 percent of their income so the difference here the savings might be 10 to 20 percent of income put aside for retirement now that leads us to how a 401k works what happens is this when you're working and you have income some of your income because of what's called a standard deduction is taxed at zero zero percent so yeah, you might have some income, you'll have some income because of a standard deduction or itemized deductions you don't pay any taxes on. Then if your income goes above that really low level, that low income level, then some of your income will be taxed at 10%. And then, you know, some income might be taxed at 12%. So let's say that you have 
an income, that amount of income, that income that you've got right there that you're earning from your job, some of it you don't have to pay any taxes on. Federal income taxes, that is. You don't have to pay, you'll have to pay 10% on some of that income and 12 on some of it. Now, if the income gets higher, you might be some of your income taxed at 22% and 24%. And it goes up, the very highest income tax rate is 37. So, if you're working and you're trying to save money for retirement, it would be really nice to avoid these high tax rates right now because you're going, well, wait a minute, I don't need the income today, but I will need it in the future. So why don't you just not tax me, government, right now on that income? Don't, pay, don't make me pay taxes on it right now because I'm not using it, but I will use it in the future. And wouldn't it be nice if I was able to avoid taxes at those high rates and take it in the future at low rates? So that's why you often hear people say, that's why they like qualified retirement plans because it allows them to avoid higher tax rates now to take it at lower rates potentially in the future and that's the idea behind the qualified plan. So the, the whole concept with 401ks is being able to defer income into the future. Okay, great. Now we're able to defer income in the future. How do I make sure that the money that I set aside today acts, has any purchasing power in the future? Because if I'm not going to use it today, I want it earning money for me, or you know, I want I potentially it would be great to have some income or returns on that money, so that when I use it in the future, that the money hasn't become worthless. I mean, think about it this way: back in the 1970s, if you were living in the 1970s, if you were around back then, you may remember that you could buy a house, and it was thirty thousand dollars to buy that house. Well, today you look at it and go, gee, if I want a house now, it's going to be probably at least 300000 What happened? The dollar went down in purchasing power. Used to be able to buy a house for 30000 now it's 300000 Well, if I put money aside and I put some money aside for my future, and let's say I put, you know, $1,000 away for the future, and let's say that if in the future that I didn't have any inflation protection on it. It might be, because remember, that's 10 times as much money right there. Well, what would happen to the purchasing power of my money? If the dollar depreciated by that much over that period of time, my purchasing power might be only 100, whoops, I don't want an extra zero there, $100. I go, well, good grief, that's not cool. I put $1,000 away and it only has $100 purchasing power, that's no good. So hence the reason when we invest that we invest using the stock market. Equities have historically been the greatest protection against inflation that we have. Why? Because what is inflation? Inflation is prices going up. When we invest in the stock market, yeah, we got to put up with ups and downs and back and forth of the stock market historically, but inflation is prices going up and it is companies raising prices. When you own stocks, or sometimes we refer to them as equities, you own the companies raising prices and hence that is why the stock market has been the greatest protector against inflation historically. So what we do is it's a balancing act. When we choose investments, what we do is we say, okay, well, here's what I want to do. I know over here I've got return or expected return. Sometimes you'll hear me refer to it as that. And here I've got risk. Risk from an academic standpoint, when we talk about risk, it's how much of this up and down that we might see. That's what we're talking about when we talk about risk. It's, you know, when I talk about risk, I'm not referring to what's the risk I'm going to lose everything. Well, for all my stocks to go down in value and not be worth anything, and if I'm really well diversified, that would mean I might, let's say, I might own 30,000 companies in my 401k plan. I might be invested in that many stocks in the marketplace or in the investing world. And that would mean that all those 30,000 companies have gone broke or bankrupt simultaneously. Well, if that happens, we probably have bigger problems on our hands. So that's not what I'm talking about. When I talk about risk, when you look at, at academic models of risk, they're just talking about how big the ups and downs are.
That's all they're talking about right there. When I'm young and bulletproof and I have lots of time, I don't worry about risk as much. So what I can do is I wanna maximize my expected return and take more risk. As I get older though, however, I don't wanna take as much risk. And the closer I get to retirement, what I do to offset some of that risk is I wanna own both stocks and bonds. So I might have some of my money still in stocks, but I'll have some of it in bonds or fixed income investments that don't fluctuate as much. Now they won't grow as much because they don't have that inflation protection, but they also don't fluctuate in value as much. They don't have as much of that going on. So that is pretty much what you're doing when you're choosing your investment mixes for your 401k. It's based on your age. I'm not gonna get into that now. It's too complicated for me to get into here in this video. But what happens when you sit with an advisor is they help you choose the asset mix between stocks and bonds. That's the first decision you make. And it's based on, hey, how long before you're gonna retire? How many years is that gonna be? How much income are you gonna take? When are you gonna take income from your investment portfolio? Those types of questions, or what's the risk that you might need to get access to this money early? Those are the type of things that we look at when we determine how much in stocks versus bonds. Then what happens when you get to retirement, then you're gonna be choosing an investment mix based on how much income you're gonna take. So that's the first decision that you make. Let me make a little, uh, just a really quick little warning, as I like to call it here, regarding target date funds. Quite often in 401ks, they will just push you into a target date fund, set it and forget it is the idea. If you're gonna retire in the year 2040, all you have to do is put your money in a target date 2040 fund and you don't have to think about anything else. The problem that you run into with a lot of these funds is they're not as diverse or diversified or spread out between enough markets for my liking. So typically what I tell our clients to do is you will have access to other funds because fund companies and employers know this. They know what I'm telling you is true. So what they will do is they will let you choose funds yourself in the 401k so as to get better diversification than you typically find in these funds. So you know, if you got one of these types of funds, you probably know it because they said, hey, if you don't want to choose your own investments, all you have to do is just choose this option right here and you don't even have to think about it. I want you to think about it. Ignorance is not bliss when it comes to retirement planning. So that's the 401k. That's the idea. Now, typically what happens with 401ks, which also makes them very, very attractive, is the idea that when you put some money aside, you decide that you're going to defer into the 401k, what they'll do is they will look at it and they go, oh, what we'll do is we'll match your contribution. The employer will match your contribution. So you may put $1,000 aside and the employer may match some percentage of that. And instead of you just putting $1,000 aside, maybe in this particular case, you'll get another $1,000. Well, that helps accelerate your saving for retirement. Now, what does that match? It really depends on your employer and their plan design. So that's way beyond the scope of this video as well. But it's a nice little thing that employers do. And there are all kinds of reasons that they do that, but it helps you save for retirement because quite frankly, you know, what happens is if we don't save for retirement, we end up in this situation where that's all you got to say. And you know, it's like 50% of the population only has social security to live on. You don't wanna be that person that is only living on social security when it gets to retirement. You want to save money for your own retirement. And one of the best ways historically is to do that through a 401k. Now there are Roth options, Roth IRA options with 401ks. Should I use a Roth? Should I use a regular one? That is a planning consideration and you have to look at your tax situation to determine which one makes the most sense. It's not always one or always the other. It's a really complicated decision and that's where financial planners can be really helpful. So I hope this little tutorial was good for you. Just kind of getting an idea of what's a qualified plan, 401ks, how do they work? Why do we use them? Why are they so popular? Well, there are lots of reasons that they're popular and hopefully now you understand that just a little bit better.